The Play Days gang will, of course, be back at the same time tomorrow. And stay tuned this afternoon, because me and my friend Kirsten have got news of our new competition, Spring in Your Step. Over we now. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to my Nostalgia Podcast. You're listening to Jack's Throwback Attack. Okay, so I'm pleased to have on the Throwback Attack Podcast puppeteer Dave Chapman. Hello there. Hello, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks for asking me on, Jack. It's very nice. I've I've listened to some of your old episodes and I feel like I'm in esteemed company. So happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's really nice of you to say. (laughs) So um, let's 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 go back right to the beginning then. So um, how did your career in puppetry start? Ah, wow. Gosh, time traveling. Uh, I uh, trained at the Jim Henson Company in 1994 uh, as a kind of background Muppet performer because they were they were doing um, auditions and training people for uh, the Muppet Treasure Island, which was their next feature in London. And they I guess they just wanted to have more people um, that were able to come in and do the background characters to assist the, the principal Muppet performers. And so they had an audition and I went along to that audition and I got to uh, trained but the, I mean the story goes back earlier than that because it's I tell it quite a lot but I wrote to Jim Henson when I was 11 and uh, I said I want to work with the company and he, he said you're too young to work with the company and uh, we're going to keep your details on file so um, that was when I was 11 and then when I was 19 having graduated Lambda I studied uh, stage production management um, I was working in the West End and uh, I got a call from my mum uh, who said I had a call on the answer phone from uh, Jim Henson Company <laughs> I was like what? So, uh, you know, it's half your life again when you're 11 to when you're 19, it's half your life again. And you go, I can't believe that's still, uh, they they get my details on file and that's great. And I'll go along and give it my best shot, but I don't hold out any hopes because I imagine there are many people who are better than me out there in the world. And, um, uh, I guess I I got the gig. (laughs) It's difficult to say that. I mean, there were lots of people there who were just sort of out of work actors or dancers who thought, oh yeah, puppeteering, I'll I'll do that. But it's obviously, um, something you need to kind of know your way around. You can't just fall into it. So I I did know my way around it, um, at an amateur level. And then they pushed my skills up to a a better level. And, uh, that was where I got my start in puppeteering. Thank you, Jim Henson company, who I still work for. (laughs) Marvellous stuff. It's it's nice that they do that, and I guess that's a credit to the the Henson Company, really, that they remembered you all those years later and thought, you know, I'll give this guy a go, even though you know they didn't they need, you got no you know not no professional training. They gave you a chance, and I think that's very nice of them. Yeah, it is very nice of them. I've told people along the path that I've met. I mean, obviously. Um... I work with the company, um, on, I don't work with them all the time, but I work with them on various projects over the years. And uh, they're a great company to work for. And uh, they're very family oriented. They're very about people. Um, and um, the, the people uh, who I tell the story to, who, who are inside as the Jim Henson company, always go, yeah, yeah, that was Jim. That's the kind of attitude. That's what, that's what they were like. You know, that's what it was like. It doesn't seem extraordinary to them, but it always seemed extraordinary to me because, you know, um, when you're trying to break into any industry and you're, I guess, Nowadays, people write emails and contact people. Back in the day, that you know, you wrote letters and made phone calls, um, which seems so archaic now. But the good thing about that is, it's a very, it's a very kind of um, uh, solid connection because you've taken the time to write a letter and you've taken the time to get interested in their company. And you, I, it, it sounds like I'm saying it's better. It's not better. It's just that back in the day, you had to really, you know, choose your choose where you were hitting your targets you couldn't scatter gun 50 emails to 50 production companies you really had to go you know who do i want to write to who do i want to give my time to uh, and where am i where am i aiming this you know arrow of my career arrow where am i aiming my career arrow <laughs> and i was and i was aiming it at jim Hudson company and uh, luckily it all went very well good stuff and uh, so was muppet treasure island the first major thing that you worked on uh, Mark Treasure Island was the first feature film I worked on. That wasn't the first uh, first thing I worked on. But, um, prior to Mark Treasure Island, I was doing um, What's Up Doc for uh, STV, um, which was on, I guess it was 94, 94, 95. And um, uh, the two fantastic Wolf characters that have been set up, uh, they were Jim Henson Company characters, actually, set up and performed fantastically by uh, John Eccleston and Don Austin. And um, for some reason, they couldn't do the last series of the show. So, 
um, they auditioned some people to come in and and, uh, and and jump in and replace them. We were never as good as they were. I just want to say that. Anybody who's listening would be like, yeah, but they were a bit rubbish. We're not rubbish, but we just weren't. <laughs> Myself and David Barclay, who's a fantastically esteemed puppeteer uh, from, from you know, movies and television, an incredible list of credits. Um, uh, he and I did our best and we had great fun, but I guess we could never replicate that sort of John and Don wackiness. They went over to Live and Kicking and did the Leprechauns and essentially recreated that double act in a different form. They were killing it over on BBC One while we were being busy on ITV One. And uh, that was my first television gig, my first proper television gig. Good, good, good. That wasn't your only foray into Saturday morning television as well, because you did, was it Telegantic Megavision? But that was not puppeteering. That was you being you. So you did a bit, of, was, bit of both. Yeah. I did. Uh, yes, that is a curious thing, because it, it all mixes into one. I've done a, a disproportionately huge amount of Saturday morning live television, uh, mainly by accident, I have to say, not by design. Um, although I was very thrilled to do it the first time around, because I am um, I was a huge fan of Saturday morning television. Uh, um, Angela Sharp and Chris Bellinger, who who made wonderful Saturday morning BBC Kids TV. I very much enjoyed ITV, and I thought Tis was, was revolutionary and exciting and crazy and brilliant. But I was more of a BBC One kind of guy. Um, um, so getting on board uh, Saturday mornings was always a pleasure, and um, I'm still doing it now. My alarm will be going off at 5 a.m. this weekend. Um, so it's that sort of um, – I really like live television. Back in the day, I liked it a lot when there was a lot of it about, because when we were doing um, those shows we just talked about, and I'm sure some other shows we're going to talk about it, it, that I did during the 90s, there was a lot of live television around. So you could watch Noel's House Party on a Saturday night, which is very reactive and very live, and you'd get involved from home. Um, then you had uh, – so dial in call and win shows and talk shows that you you know there was, there was all kinds of stuff going on um tfi friday is what i'm trying to say is you know like a live talk show um which was a brilliant format uh and then there was a big breakfast every day and then there was you know strong breakfast television in, in all sectors channel four had a sort of strong breakfast strand so there's a lot of live is what i'm trying to say and i loved live nowadays there's not so much live so the reason i'm doing it again is because it's now quite a rare thing to go uh can i be on telly and i can be i can improvise live on national that's crazy <laughs> how does this happen so um I, I i've done a lot of it and i'm a big fan of it and i watch it if i'm not if i'm not um, working on it i always still put telly on saturday morning i love it saturday morning tv is always fantastic and, and definitely we will talk a little bit more about that later on some of the other shows that you've done but going back to the 90s i guess that the main thing that you were doing at that time was otis the aardvark on cbbc in like the continuity bits um, how did that come about uh, uh this is kind of a weird story um my not, nothing in my life is straightforward listeners um my friend al petri who is a wonderful actor who plays their master in sex education presently um and is in rogue one star wars movie we got to work together which is crazy and in many many other things is a wonderful british actor um and does a lot of work uh, he was friends with someone at the BBC and we bumped into each other at Fulham Broadway tube station. He bumped into me at Fulham Broadway and said, uh, oh, I've got a friend who's working at the BBC and uh, they need a uh, puppeteer. Are you, you still doing all the puppet stuff? And I said, yeah, I've just been at Jim Henson Company and I'm you know, doing this ITV job. Um, uh, you know, give me a number, that would be great. So I called up Fiona Thompson, who was the researcher, and I went along to the BBC and I did an audition, so to speak, on the studio with a puppet character they had. Um, and uh, they offered me the job the next week, I think. So it was weird because I was doing live Saturday mornings for ITV. And at the same time, I was doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday on the BBC with Otis. But Otis was a bit of a shonky puppet to start with. So I said, I'll take the job as long as I can switch this puppet because it's shonky. And they said, <laughs> with respect to the original builder, um, uh, they said, yeah, OK. So I came along and I was silent. Uh, he was a silent character. And then they wanted him to talk like he had a very big nose, <laughs> which wasn't very exciting. I wasn't very stimulated by that as a character choice. Uh, and then we switched the puppet and then I just did everything the way I wanted to do it. Changed his voice, <laughs> just changed the puppet, changed the voice overnight. Everything went different. And uh, from that point on, it kind of flew. Yeah, that was just thanks to the designers, uh, Karen Prell, Dave Barclay, Mike Quinn, three uh, people who, who were brilliant in designing and building a new Otis, the, the Otis that we all now know and love. So I'm very grateful to them because uh, without a good puppet character, without a good design, you know, you're high and dry. You can be as funny as you like and do as many wacky voices as you like. But if the puppet character isn't appealing or isn't, you know, nice, then you're in trouble. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Otis the Aardvark was part of CBBC. 
what was it, about six, seven years in total, was it? Something like that? No, five. You've, five. you've credited me with more time. And uh, the internet says that I got fired for being too naughty, which is complete fallacy. I left because I had done everything I could do within that framework. Um, and I just basically, th- those jobs eat material. So you can write all day and all night and you'll still have not enough material. So after five years of essentially writing every single week um, of, of every year, you just go, I, I want to stop while I'm, I quit while I'm ahead. You know, I really like the character. It's great fun, really helped me uh, get a foothold in the industry. But I always think you should leave the party uh, while it's still fun. And that's uh, something I always do. And I advise anyone out there to do. Um, because leave on a high, people think it was a cool character. And the other thing I didn't want to do really is become the guy who does Otis for 25 years. You know, there, there is a danger that, although I respect people who have gone before me who have done that, there's been brilliant acts who have had public characters who have gone on for years and years and years. But times change and things move on and the media changes. So, you know, if I were to do, like I loved Rod Holland Nino, I thought they were hysterical. But the thing about them was they could go around and tour the theatres and do acts, um, do their acts. You know, you could write an hour and then you could tour around the country for two years because every different town or city hasn't seen that act. But as, as things changed and as uh, media moved on, it, that just wasn't feasible to me. I was thinking, well, i got to move on. got to keep moving. Let's see what else, is, what else is out there. And it was quite a dangerous move as well because I, I could have been out of work for years, Jack. It could have been a disaster. <laughs> but it was okay. Fair enough, fair enough. And I guess the reason why I thought it was longer is I think because um, – Otis did appear in programmes as well as the continuity. I remember um, shows like Insides Out and stuff like that that ran a bit longer. Yes, yeah. yes you're absolutely right, Mr. Jack. Your knowledge is better than mine. That's <laughs> devastating. Um, you're absolutely right. The character on air would have lasted probably six years because of Insides Out, which is a show I did with Mark Spate and Marcelly Stewart. And I guess there was a, Cl- a Clever Creatures, which was a sound of Otis kind of panel show thing, which we did with BBC Bristol, Natural History Unit. So, yeah, he did have a life after Prez, but essentially I taped all those beforehand. Yeah. So the, the whole of Otis's world existed in my life for five years. And then uh, and then I went off and did different things, and he, he kind of lived on in those sort of ways. And I, there was also offers to develop him and do more things with him. There was offers of his own spin-off shows, and and I it, it just was I was just done. And it, it sounds crazy because a lot of people – People were, you know, pretty freaked by me going, no thanks. <laughs> and they were going, but why? But why? I remember one of the BBC executives said to me, well, what are you going to do? Like as if like uh, there was nothing else for me. I was just put on this planet to be an aardvark. And that was it. Uh, and I just thought, I said, I remember saying, well, I don't know. I just want to, you know, do other things, see what's out there. And uh, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> Yes, and it paid off in the long run. It paid off in the long run. And um, what are your kind of favourite memories with Otis? Like, you know, that live television experience. Are there any moments that happen that really stick out for you? It's difficult. It feeds into the thing we said before about there being so much material, you, you know, eating content. So much uh, has to be created every single day uh, that you have, uh, you know, a memory a day that's, that's kind of interesting or, or strange. And also live television puts you in very strange situations but i would say things like going to 10 downing street um which is just the christmas the christmas kids party which is wonderful they do every year um because you kind of you're there with a puppet aardvark and there's kind of mps around you and various celebrities and luminaries of the british industry and of course wonderful kids who are there to entertain and have a laugh with um but you kind of go, wow, how did I get here? You know, I'm in 10 Downing Street. That's the prime minister over there. This is very strange. So there's that sort of thing. Um, I guess laughing an awful lot. Uh, I made some very close friendships, which I still have to this day, uh, with some of the on-screen talent and some of the off-screen talent. Um, and um, being very, fr- it's a very free environment back then, very different world. I remember long improvisation on, on air, lots of kind of wacky, losing our minds, laughing moments, both on air and off air. Um, but yeah, uh, and just really, really enjoying it. You know, Television Centre was an extraordinary place to work back in those days because it was full of, I sound like a real old grandpa now. It was full of all the talented people all there. Um, there was, you know, there'd be in TC1, there'd be um, Top of the Pops or Later with Jules. And then the next in two, there'd be, you know, Vic and Bob. In three, there'd be Rick and A doing Bottom. You know, in, in four, there'd be, you know, Watchdog with Alan Robinson. In five, there'd be Alan Partridge. I mean, this is obviously not on the same week. Week, but that you know it was a pack, jam-packed place so the over the overriding memory is of being 
what felt like um, in a fantastic cultural kind of empire where you could dip in and you could go and see other people's shows. You didn't need security passes to get in particularly, not like nowadays. Um, so you could just wander in and watch people rehearse. I mean, it's insane. Uh, so I guess it, it, my overriding memory is of feeling very lucky, having a wonderful time, laughing a lot, and um, seeing a lot of my heroes as well, because I was a big fan of a lot of TV stuff, especially TV comedy. So it's quite nice to drop in and see those people and sometimes meet those people and chat, you know. I'm very blessed. So, yeah, the, the overriding memory is just joyous. It was wonderful fun. I'm sure there were days that weren't, but <laughs> the memory is fabulous. <laughs> great stuff, great stuff. And uh, what was it like to... Um, bring back Otis for a short time when CBBC turns 30 in 2015. Uh, that was weird. Uh, it is, it's very strange. You do drop straight back into it because, because of the fact that you've done so much of it. Um, but it is strange. I mean, I don't, I don't, um, I, again, there's been various people called over the years wanting him for various things. And I've said no to all of them. Uh, I did, I did do Lee Francis show um, Celebrity Juice because it was irresistible and I love his stuff. Uh, and obviously I know uh, Fern and Holly, who I both worked with in, when I was doing puppet characters. So uh, there was a sort of a strong connection or reason to go and do that show. Um, so the only thing I've done is, is the 30th anniversary and um, Celebrity Juice. And it is odd because it's like putting on an old pair of shoes uh, that you haven't worn for a long time. But it's very comfortable very quickly. And you go, oh, yeah, I remember. He laughs like this and he thinks this stuff is funny. And, you know, he reacts to that. And it all just comes flowing back, you know. So it was it was nice to do, I guess. Yes, there is one other appearance you've not mentioned, uh, The Weakest Link. Ah, ah yeah, <laughs> Weakest Link, of course. That was post press. You are so good at your uh, TV trip. Um, yeah, Weakest Link with Anne Robinson and with loads of wonderful puppeteers uh, being fab and having a very strange afternoon at Pinewood Studios. Uh, but yeah, that was kind of fun, although I went out on the second. I don't know, I went out really quickly because I had a brain blur. I was awful. I, I was so keen on going i'm a sharp mind i will win this and be the king of the puppets and uh, i really didn't I had, a, I had a brain fart when and they said to me when she asks you the questions you know it's, it's really quick fire it's not like being at home you know it's different and they were right she was scary and she discombobulated me with her evil stare and i got a very very simple question very very wrong and uh, and now I am sad about that because it's on YouTube and then people go, I saw you on YouTube on the week. I think you're a rabbit. And you go, yeah, sorry. That's just the way it goes. <laughs> I guess it's difficult, really, because, you know, it's one thing having to answer quick fire questions, but the sense of having to operate and voice a puppet, <laughs> I can imagine mm. it really does add to it. It makes it 10 times more trickier. Yeah, it does. It does because it's very much puppeteering is very much pat your head and rub your tummy stuff anyway uh in all circumstances whatever you're doing and it can get more and more and more dense and complex depending on what the uh, type of character you're performing uh but yeah you're right i mean answering general knowledge questions that you don't have a clue what's incoming is scary <laughs> but like i said i drove there thinking i will come first or maybe second or third but i won't be anything lower than that and uh, i went out second but i think john and don went out first the left so um so that made me feel okay because they're both very canny and sharp-minded so they got freaked by Annie as well. But I knew her, I'd seen her a lot. She used to, um, Points of View was in the studio next to CBBC. So I used to see her an awful lot um, when we were originally up inside Television Centre because we ended up changing studios halfway through my tenure at CBBC. But originally next door was uh, Jonathan Ross doing uh, the film programme and, and Robinson doing Points of View uh, and some other bits and pieces. But that's, they were very small studios. So um, we used to see those guys regularly. And she was, um, I mean, she's fantastic. <laughs> yes, certainly, certainly. Great to hear your memories of that. Um, so one final thing with Otis. I, I hear from a mutual friend of ours that you still own Otis, but rather only a part of him, like he's not doing too good these days, I hear. <laughs> That is very true. Yeah, puppets are not very often uh, known in the wider world, but puppets uh, degenerate very, very quickly. Uh, they have like a 10-year period uh, where they will, unless you air seal them like you would with taxidermy or something, um, the foam degenerates, dries out, and turns to biscuit crumbs, just turns to dust. So essentially, I don't want to alarm your listeners, but um, all that is left of Otis is his head. Um, and the rest of him really it just went to bits. Although I did do an Observer photograph shoot last year um where i did use his head and his arm i still have an arm as well uh, and i kind of jerry rigged this sort of foam body and put a shirt on it you'd never know in the photo that he's not complete anymore but he is sadly 
incomplete. Kirsten O'Brien has one in her loft, which I believe is complete, but I know for a fact will be, you know, dust now, although she always says, I've got an Otis, I've got an Otis. Um, and there was one, uh, perhaps the Film and Television Museum at some point, I don't know, the missing in action. But I, if, they're, if they're all out there, they will all be dry and crumbly and, and it's a shame. No, I was going to say, I, I have seen an Otis that was at the Lowry in Salford about seven years ago at an, at an exhibition. Might be the same one from the Bradford one that you mentioned. Yeah, maybe. But they are. But all I know is that they will all be because uh, they all, I mean, the one the one I had was the youngest, if you like. That was year five. And the ones that are out there are years one, two, three and four, because I went through one public character a year. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure. Quite scary that they're missing in action. I don't know what they're up to. Terrifying. As long as no one's performing them, I don't care. <laughs> Phil Fletcher, a puppeteer who I'm sure is known to your listeners, who plays Hacker the Dog. He has offered to build me a notice, actually, a rebuild a notice, which I must take him up on that offer. Uh, because I do, I, I, it feels weird not having a full puppet character in the world, in case anyone does call and says, here's a good thing. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I might take Phil up on that because it would be good to have one in the house, just so I know that, you know, if anyone needs him, he's good to go. Absolutely. Well, I've got to ask, haven't I? Can you do the voice for us? It's been a while. Yeah, it's really loud. I'm going to back off the mic for this. Um, okay. Hold on a second. Oh, Mr. Jack, <laughs> what is this podcast? I do not understand. What is a podcast? <laughs> I am in a pod. Mm. It's a bit like that. It's a bit like that. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you for that. That's my that's my day, uh, mate. No worries. <laughs> yeah. Right then. <laughs> so, um, of course, during your time um, doing Otis on CBBC, um, you got to work with Dick and Dom, which has led to quite a long career with them. Really, I mean, uh, you know, how did <clears> you how did you um, originally meet, and how did that bond start? Well, uh, Rich was the runner. Uh, Rich is Dick from Dick and Dom. Uh, real name Rich. Uh, he was the runner at CBC and then he auditioned to be a presenter. And so I knew him from when he was the runner at sub 17. Um, and he was great fun, always great fun. Great, he's a fantastic, very funny chap. Um, and so that's how I got to know Rich. Uh, Dom was a young magician of the year and then he auditioned to be a CBC presenter and got the gig. And he too. Although <laughs> it pains me to say it because Dominic's such a funny character. Uh, he is also a wonderful man. Uh, but uh, he, he, and, uh, he and I got on very well, as did um, Rich. The only reason I say Dominic is a wonderful man is because he would hate that. He would think that that's too. No, don't say that. I want people to think that I'm really edgy. He's edgy, but he's also a wonderful man. Um, and we all got on. Uh, Kirsten was there as well, Simi and Corti. Um, and uh, we were all mates. So. When Rich and Dom started to do their own thing um, as a sort of double act, I was still at CBBC. Oh, and Steve Wilson was there as well. He's a wonderful presenter. He's on this morning um, with uh, Philip and Holly right now. Um, um, although they were working as a double act when I was there, um, and we just got on very well. And I guess in TV terms, when you get on as friends, um, it, it serves the product incredibly well. So when you see shows that you like and you think that the people who host them are friends, then they usually are. If it looks like they're not very friendly, they usually aren't. Um, so I guess they called me up and said, oh, you know, Dom called up actually and said, um, we got to, I'm going to do a puppet cat. You know, I'm going to do a puppet cat next door. cat. And probably do some voices, do some funny voices, and dress up and that as well. Uh, do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, okay, that sounds like a hoot. So, um, so the show was already running on the channel and then it was moving to BBC One. So that's why Dom called me up. They had a sort of a wider brief on BBC One. And uh, and I was, oh yeah, I ran at it. I'd seen the show and I loved the show very much. I thought what they were doing was brilliant. The original, the brainchild of Steve Ride uh, and directed by Simon Hepworth. Um, and, and who, you know, fantastic, fantastic live chaos director, a fantastic producer and many, many people as well, who came along for the ride. There's, there's lots of assistant producers on that show who are all doing extremely exciting things nowadays. And the, most of them stayed in the industry and are uh, making wonderful television that you all watch, but I won't go through all their bit of individual credits, but it was a strong team, strong format, dear friends at the helm. And so I thought this is a shoe and this is gonna be great fun. And it was so much fun. Uh, I, I, I get asked a lot, uh, what was my favorite thing I've ever done? And I would say Dick and Dom in the Bungalow because I have never, ever laughed so much at work as I did then. And uh, I do laugh at work a lot now, but I, we were just, it was just crazy. I mean, the, you know, what you saw on screen was just <laughs> the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, great stuff. It what it was a show that I absolutely adored. I loved Dick and Dom in the Bungalow, and it was just so funny. There was just nothing like it on at the time, and I think it was the last thing that was on that was like that. I don't think you'd get away with a, a fair bit of what went on, on on the show, and it just came across as just mental. A lot of the humour in it was just, you know, just went over your head as a child, and it was so surreal, and it did look like organised chaos. Like, a, a lot of the time it, it looked like that wasn't meant to happen or, you know, people weren't expecting something to happen. That's how it came across anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, anything, I mean, genuinely, uh, it's so easy to say this, it, the authenticity of the surprises in the show, they're all real. So no one's ever stooging. No one's ever going, oh, I didn't expect that. All the stuff that uh, appears to be a surprise, especially on the boys, uh, was a surprise on the boys, and we uh, didn't rehearse it, uh, which is, again, extraordinary when you've got sort of three-hour live Saturday morning kids show. Uh, the boys had very little to no respect for rehearsals, uh, <laughs> and we would all get together as a sort of uh, on a Friday afternoon with the uh, with the proviso we were going to rehearse the show. We never ever rehearsed the show properly. We just used to look at like if we were doing an end game that was complicated. So I mean, Steve. The producer used to pull his hair out he'd be like come on we're gonna rehearse but he would say okay well let's look at the bits that we don't know let's look at the end game because it's you know ian's doing tele addicts or dave's doing strike it lucky and you guys need to know how the tele addicts format works or you need to know how the strike it lucky format works otherwise we're all uh, out see so we would kind of step through it but we certainly never like i never revealed anything i was going to say on the show in rehearsals because that would take the fun out of the stuff you identify which is the live goofy you know off the cuff feeling um it was an extraordinary show for that it was completely out there there's been nothing like it before or since where there was just long form improvisation and some shows just took off on a completely left turn they would drop 15 items because they were having too much fun pretending to be the Scooby-Doo gang or we were having too much fun uh, with the kids. Like when the kids came in once, the meet the kids section, which is where you say hi to the kids and you find out if they've got any special talents, find out their names. Uh, uh, that's like a four minute item. One time that went to 35 minutes. Now, there's no other format in the world where you could go, hey, you know, we usually spend four minutes on that. Let's do over half an hour on that. Why not? Um, and that that flexibility, again, I don't know that that, that particularly will happen again. And and, and the, the, the sort of... Um, the, the improv sort of quality of it. There's, there's not room for that anymore because, you know, they have, they, they have to know what you're going to say to a point. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, the responsibility is just down to the performer. And, and that's, that's, it's a very crazy thing to do. Although with us, it worked out. We, we never got in well, we got lots of trouble. We never got in serious trouble. <laughs> there were a couple of times there was some complaints, I seem to remember. Um, though you yeah. go on about the, uh, the, the, you know, surprising the boys. Um, there's one particular moment that you're responsible for in Dick and Dom in the Bungalow, which is my all time favourite moment in the entire show's run. And I actually wow. put this clip up on YouTube on my on my Facebook to just say to my friends, I'm interviewing the guy that's responsible for this, <laughs> okay, in a wow. bit later. Um, it is the neighbours cat and it was the stoke on trent song <laughs> ah lovely stoke on trent song a little did i know how that would follow me down the years uh yeah it's amazing stoke on trent song because it's because it's uh it's adored by people in stoke or allegedly online i'm not sure everybody loves it but um it was a bit random the the cat used to be obsessed with regional towns and visit odd places and he decided to write a song about stoke on trent i have to say i didn't write the song it was written by um bloody austra uh, who are wonderful andy Blythe and martin yastra who do all the music for dick and dom in the bungalow and uh their vote their work is well ev everything is theirs in that show um so they wrote it i wrote some ones further down the line uh and it was a surprise on the lads so yeah dominic thinks i'm gonna say it's on youtube um you know, he says, Pussycat, Pussycat, where have you been? And he thinks I'm going to say kind of a two line gag. So I'm going to go, I went to so and so, and this funny thing happened there. And then I'm, he's going to punch me in the face and I'm going to leave. Uh, but of course, I burst into song and it freaked both of them out. <laughs> and then we did it a lot after that, actually. We did we did lots of goofy songs. And then his bum sang for Dominic one week in the style of Eminem, which was quite exciting. Uh, but yeah, it became a thing. But most of those things, again, it's just Steve going, uh, it would be fun with Steve Wright, the producer, would, would it be funny if the cat just start singing? And uh, up to that point, I don't think he had ever sung. So it was. And I'm lying down as well. I want to put this out there. I'm lying down. It's very hard to sing when you're lying down. Um, so I'm, I'm lying down with my hand through the cat flap 
with the cat head on it. Uh, so the fact that I even sang it and it was remotely in tune, which I don't know that it is, but it sounds okay. Um, but yeah, I've, I've got quite a lot. Of, down the years, a lot of people have gone, people from Stoke, say hey you uh, did you do the capital yes and they go oh you're the stoke on trent guy <laughs> and they go, yeah they go why stoke on trent and i always go why not so we were just choosing interesting fun places around england that we thought would be funny to write a song about stoke's got a lot to sing about you know <laughs> absolutely absolutely no, it was a great moment one of my favorites um, it's, it's funny to watch even now um, there's two other moments that you're responsible for that i loved um but the, they weren't puppet ones the ones where you were uh, performing um you mentioned it just one was strike it lucky your your impression of michael barrymore was just hilarious um <laughs> and also the crystal maze one um that was you wasn't it doing oh, yeah. brian yeah <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, they're both um, uh, both extreme pleasures. Uh, again, the the heat the heat is on you slightly uh, with those with with those big end games. They're about fourteen minutes in duration, and uh, Steve would say to you on a Thursday. And then he'd say, you know how the game works, right? And then he'd say, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And we play the game. Most of the structures of those games are played as the original games were. Um, and then he's like, make it funny. And that was it. So then you didn't have a sort of responsibility between Thursday afternoon and Saturday morning to make sure that you've got a sort of funny take on, on that character. And so I would get a VHS because YouTube wasn't very densely populated in those days. So get a VHS of Michael Byron or a VHS of Richard O'Brien. And I would watch the cassette and I would go, oh, okay, they do this and they do this. And then figure the impersonation out and then write some gags <laughs> and write some goofy stuff to do. Uh, and yeah, Strike It Monkeys is a good one. That's another one that I get asked about uh, 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 because Barry, Michael Barrymore actually tweeted about it and was very complimentary about it. So that helped that. And Richard O'Brien... Uh, people are so fond of Crystal Maze, Richard O'Brien is, that uh, that one comes up quite a lot as well. And then online people are going, when the show gets revived, why don't they get Dave Chapman to do it? Which would be so weird because I would be impersonating Richard O'Brien. But they're both very strong, fun characters to do. Uh, Michael Bible sort of, uh, all, all, all about, is all that. And uh, Richard O'Brien, what's Richard O'Brien? Oh, um, he's like that, isn't he? Very strange. Oh, mummy wouldn't like. He's got, so they're both very e kind of easy hooks to grab onto, and uh, then you just have to hope the fun happens with the with the, the kids and the um, and the game, and that stuff goes wrong. Because again, that's all. It's always aching for things to go wrong, um, and we never engineered wrong either. That's another you know another thing that's worth saying is we never. There's never any kind of like oh let's fake out like something went wrong and all laugh like there's never things are just generally going wrong because we haven't rehearsed it. Ta da. <laughs> so yeah it was uh, they were both great fun to do as was the cat i didn't do the cat for you i should do the cat he's also he's a bit like that isn't he oh no i don't he's a bit sort of les dawson well, he's not like les dawson but he's just that sort of um oh i don't know about this uh podcast i don't like it i can't see anybody hello can you see me no what's the point that's the cat <laughs> spot on spot on because i also remember as well you did that voice um when they did ask the family the same kind of voice and i always remember you'd read out the scores and then go ha 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 rubbish at the end of every uh, score. <laughs> yeah although that voice now that's interesting but that voice is not uh because the cat comes from somewhere up north. he's broadly in the north i don't know where he's from but he's broadly in north, um which is terrible insults to northern people by the way i can do the the individual visual accents but for the cat i chose not to um but yes, uh, that voice is English. So it's, um, ah, ah, dreadful. oh dear, oh no, what rubbish. Ah, ah. They're both very deep and gruff. <laughs> it's great to hear them all over again. It's just it's bringing it all back to me. Um, do you, because you own part of Otis, do you own the cat still? Uh, the cat has gone the same way of as Otis. I do have him. He's in a bag, but he is just a bag of dust with some ping pong ball eyes and i miss he's a i love that character to bits um he's really funny and really easy to perform because he's just basically cynical but he likes everything but he's just sort of cynical about stuff uh that's a weird dichotomy actually he's cynical but he likes everything but that's well that's how it works in my brain um so yeah he has also um really gone to gone to dust i mean neil sternberg who's a fantastic puppet builder who builds all these characters um he has all the puppet the patterns so he could easily make cats if we need one uh, and it, I mean, he rustles something up pretty quickly, uh, I'm sure. So they, they, although we're so sort of sad they die or it's melancholic, oh God, they don't exist anymore. They're very, very easy, as long as Neil doesn't get run down by a bus, to replicate and recreate, you know, should anyone ever need them. Fingers crossed with that. Um, so um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, how did you feel when um, the bungalow finished? Because as a viewer, I was heartbroken. I actually feel... 
I actually remember that day, I remember being so sad. And I feel that that was kind of like the end of my childhood because when Dick and Dom ended, I was 12, I think, maybe nearly 13. So getting a bit too old for kids TV. And it just felt like that was the natural end. And it was like, oh, it's so sad. Wow, that's so profound. We, we didn't really have any idea of that thing. Although, again, down the years, I've heard it from various people. And it, and it happens recently, it's three months ago. Somebody I was working with on a, on a, a big series, um, uh, the director's assistant, said, uh, oh, I'm so sad when I finished. I loved it when I was a kid. And you suddenly go, yeah, we... We felt the same way, but um, I, as I was saying earlier on, um, you know, I, I'm a massive exponent of the quit while you're ahead rule. And Rich and Dom felt the same. Uh, not because of me, they just felt the same. Uh, so they wanted to just, yeah, move on. And so we were all very, very sad and we, we wanted to do the show forever. I could easily have done another 10 years, but it's the most fun I've ever had in telly. Uh, but but they were right, you know, um, because it's it sits out there now as a, as a, a little weird cult classic and that's cool uh and i, I mean I, there's 20 years since uh, the boys started doing bungalow which is nuts because that makes us all feel really old but um but i think they made the right choice and i'm sad to hear that you were sorry to see it go but at the same time you know we didn't sell out and go cheesy and it was never sort of uh, you know it could have gone rubbish it could have been like let's set up a fake thing or let's do a different thing where we it just had to be those ingredients it was about uh steve ride the producer Simon hepworth the uh director pat mckeeman who's camera super and richard and dominic myself ian kirkby melvin odoom uh and, and without that team and with a wonderful art team wonderful floor management team great ap's system producers directors so many contributories but essentially those people, uh, you know, I like mentioned at the top of there, without them, it would be weird. It would be so weird. And, I, you know, if the boys ever do a special or something, there's no way they would do it without Steve Ride and Simon Hepworth because they are essential ingredients, off-screen ingredients that you guys all never see, but uh, we hear them in our ears all the way through the show. So you're constantly listening to them and they're giving you mad direction. <laughs> <laughs> I guess in hindsight it was it was the best thing to do quit while you're ahead because you know there are shows out there which have been brilliant and ran too long and then everybody hates them and that's that's the last thing you want and uh, just when you're 12 yeah. years old it's your favourite show it's the worst thing ever but hey ho it was one of them but the good thing is is that it still remains very fond in people's hearts and memories it will be looked back on for many years and I hope with fingers crossed that one day they bring it back for a one-off a bit like how they brought back Tiz Was for one day and SMTV for that special i hope one day that yeah. happens i've got all of my fingers crossed on that one <laughs> yeah i well i feel like i mean i don't know but i i feel like because of the 20th anniversary there you know there's been a bit of chat about stuff uh, i don't know what the lads uh, plans are but certainly people have been inquiring with the lads about you know 20 years old and this was a thing you did and do you want to talk about it and I, i'm not sure what the what the movements are but i certainly know that that is bubbling around as a as a as a conversation because because it's 20 years and again it's a generation like your generation sort of fond memories of saturday mornings it's a real privilege to have been a part of it i mean i'm so so pleased to have gone side because like i say it was my favorite job i laughed till i cried every weekend um but at the same time i look at clips on youtube and just go wow this is so crazy because of how everything's changed um and and that that, that crazy freedom that we had which was you know amazing you know Indeed. And although, um, you know, the bungalow finished, you've still continued to work with Dick and Dom with the Slammer. Uh, 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 no, sorry, that was the same team. Dick, oh, but Dick and Dom in the Slammer, I can't remember now. And also the legend of Dick and Dom as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. I worked with them on Legend. Um, Slammer, they guested, I think they guested on the Slammer, but they were, they were the same uh, uh, creative team as Bungalow. Uh, well, Steve Ride and some of the creative Bungalow team. Um, but uh, yeah, Legend of Dick and Dom, again, uh, fantastic fun. I mean, uh, only just pipped by Bungalow for laughs. I, we laughed and laughed and laughed on that show because there was uh, Richard Dom, obviously, in every page of the show. I played the baddie, the Beastmaster, uh, and then myself and Ian Kirkby played everyone else basically uh which is a weird gig uh but chloe bale fantastic um and the first brilliant comedian who plays the uh, wizard manitol um all of, again there's six of us really in that show uh there is augmented occasionally by guest artists um stephen k moss came on and phil cornwell came on and uh oh what's his name uh alan ford from uh from lock stock and two smoking barrels came on lots of guest artists but essentially it was us six in the woods at the back of pinewood about Black Park for uh, about oh, one time we were there for about five months we shot two series back to back but um, yeah great great fun again working with your friends um, funny scripts um, cooking uh, Carter and Cook wrote a lot of those um, 
And uh, yeah, it was just uh, fun all day and all night. Uh, uh, and just getting to play all these weird characters. I mean, a lot of the characters in that show, Ian and I were based on people that we liked or we'd base them on old BBC uh, characters. There's one where he's outrageously Eric Morker and I'm outrageously Frank Spencer. Uh, but yeah, it was brilliant. But I watched that those clips on YouTube fondly as well. And I uh, remember uh, laughing a lot and just uh, rock and rolling it, you know, because we just had so much to shoot. So you have to get through it. They were long series. Um, so it's hard work, but again, fun working with people that you love working with and uh, an absolute privilege. You know? Great. Well, long may that partnership continue. Um, I was looking as well at some of the other stuff you'd done, and there was, there was another children's BBC series, um, or character rather, or two characters, um, that I'd completely forgotten about. and was like, oh, my God, this was fantastic. And also, this was fantastic, and also off the wall. Um, Tiny and Mr Duck um, from the Saturday show, oh, and then yeah. they had their uh, their own show as well. Tiny Mr would like to claim responsibility for Tiny Mr Duck. It was generally myself and Damien Farrell, who is a brilliant Irish man, um, who I work with a lot, um, he and I created them. Um, Mr. For anyone who didn't see it, uh, Tiny was a giant hamster, and uh, his manager was Mr. Duck, who's a small duck wearing a suit. And uh, yeah, we did live Saturday morning stuff um, on the Saturday show with Danny Bear and Joe Mace, and then uh, Simon and Fern Cotton. And uh, then we did our own show, Tiny Mr. Duck Show, which is a bit like shooting stars for kids. And uh, Kirsten O'Brien from CBC came back as a team captain, and Joe Pasquale, the wonderful Joe Pasquale, uh, was the other team captain. And uh, yeah, that was a, that was a very that was quite a nuts series. I don't know, is there any of that on YouTube? There's a little bit, is there? I w- was watching an episode a couple of hours <laughs> ago for research. So yes, there is an episode on there. Wow, that's oh, I have to have a look. Um, yeah, Tiny was cute. Oh, Mr. D, I want to be in show business. Yeah, yeah. It was like a big sort of soppy uh, duvet with eyes. Um, but yeah, great fun again. We got to do some fab things. Uh, did a lot of press junkets where you go and interview celebrities when they're promoting movies. So we kind of, you know, we interviewed Samuel L. Jackson and uh, Hayden Christensen for the early Star Wars uh, movies, and um, yeah, Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones and uh, Uri Geller and lots of interesting characters. Um, I mean, you know, we you meet these people for three minutes before you interview them, and the next thing they're talking to a giant hamster and a small duck. But it was great fun. And Joe uh, Pasquale was just hysterical. I was, we were huge fans of Joe from when we were kids. Both of us uh, really liked his stuff. And when we were looking around for team captains, uh, he was our first choice. And amazingly, he, he said yes. Uh, it was before he'd gone into the jungle and became super famous again. Um, but, yeah, he's, he's a gentleman and a player and great fun to work with. Uh, and he... He just got it, you know. He just get he. Well, surprisingly, Joe's mind is kind of wacky too, um, and uh, so it's really wicked to work with him and and sort of improvise and goof around with him. Do do do! I can't believe it, David Ross. This is your puppet. Oh my god! He'd be he'd be you know uh, he, he'd just make us laugh. Background fact: quite an expensive show for puppets. It was very big, um, but we did have a really good time. And they, I don't know. I mean, maybe they'll come out of the cupboard another day. I don't know. They're, they're lovely characters to do, and I like working with Damien very much. He's very funny, very quick-minded. So, you know, who knows? Who knows indeed? And yes, it was like a kid shooting stars. And going on to that, actually, I, I read something. I want to check if this is true. Is it true that you were the puppeteer of the baked potato when Matt Lucas did that, that song the first time around on Shooting Stars? That is true. That is true, Jack Hayward, you amazing TV trivia. He's on my shelf, actually, the Joe Baked Potato, but because this is not a visual form, I will not get him off of the shelf. Um, but yeah, I did. Um, Matt uh, Lucas, my, oh, it's a long, uh, it's not a very long story, but the, the boiled down version is that Matt said, Dave, you did puppets. So I went, yes. He said, I want to do some Jack Potatoes. I was like, oh, okay, fine. And so uh, we did Jack Potatoes on, which again, you have no idea. I went to the studio, I was there for 40 minutes. That's why Matt laughed, Matt Corpses. And uh, Matt was a bit like, oh, Corpse, oh, no, should we do another one? The producer went, no, no, it's fine. It's funny. It's funny that you find your own Jack Potato. <laughs> so funny. Uh, so it's one take wonder. And it's literally 40 minutes. So I traveled downstairs and television. I went to the studio, did the Jacob Potato, went home. And then it just goes on and on and on because of YouTube. And uh, and also what's funny about it for me, from my career point of view, is I've done lots and lots of different things as you're talking about today. And I, I continue to do lots of different things. <laughs> the, the, the thing that most people are most impressed by is, Dave, you're a Jack Potato. Sorry, don't you're a Jack Potato. And you go, yep. And that's the thing they like the most. It has no eyes. It has no arms. It's in one minute of television. But that's what the, that's what the public want. They want singing vegetables. <laughs> and uh, the, the the most bizarre thing is that is the fact that 
you know, 20 years later, that becomes such a sensation last year <laughs> during the lockdown when the song was brought back, um, you know, it was part yeah. of uh, part of the uh, the NHS campaign. It's mental. <laughs> Yeah, it was wonderful. We were I actually spoke to Matt around the time. It was really annoying because it was in uh, like really early lockdown and the my we were going to we were thinking of doing it, you know, doing it for somehow getting the potato uh, back on blah blah. We just couldn't we, get, we couldn't get close to one another. You, could, you know, we couldn't do it. We couldn't meet up because of lockdown. So we didn't shoot anything. Uh, Matt shot self shot his element and then he got an animator to do a wonderful uh, emotion of Jack Potato singing his thing. So it was all fine, but it was a shame because it would have been quite fun to revive the real the real deal. But uh like I say, it's the dinner you on a job and say, Hey Dave, um, you know, uh just talking to us that um and then you know what's coming. It's either uh it's either the cat or another strange thing. Oh, sorry, it's either the Jack Potato or it's another strange thing that I did for five minutes. <laughs> So what I'm guessing is, is that you don't want that on your epitaph, you know, <laughs> singing potato or talking aardvark. <laughs> uh, no, I no. Controversially, it sounds like I'm being negative. I'm not being negative. I'm super proud of it. I'm I'm super proud of my jacket potato. It's just funny that it's so lo-fi. So uh, yeah, it was a pleasure to do. Uh, obviously, Matt was very. I mean, and Jim Bick and Bob were very uh, big at the time. It was very much the show, as I'm sure you remember. On a, I think it was a Friday night, nine thirty. I'm not sure, but you know, shooting stuff was well, I was an absolute pleasure to be on and be a part of. So I don't mind it being on my avatar. I just find it funny that you can do stuff that costs me you know, a gazillion dollars and you rehearse and shoot for months and months and months and is yeah and, and people go, oh yeah, yeah, I know you do that, but hey, you were the Jack Potato. So I'm I'm happy being Jack Potato. He's really wonderful. And uh and, and like I say, people get a kick out of it. And I laughed when I first saw it. I was like, this is so stupid. And we did do it again actually. There's another one. Um he has um a German, that's a German Jack Potato uh, that Matt did further down the line, which is probably on YouTube as well, I'm sure. Yes, I remember now. Yeah, there was there was a, another one years later, wasn't there? Um, yeah. Yes, yes, that was. I think that was when they revived it about ten years ago, wasn't it? Something like that. Yeah, I seem to remember. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It's coming back to me. It was a great show, very very funny. Um, so we've talked a lot about you know the stuff in the past. Um, let's move on to more recent stuff. Um, I know that um, you've worked quite heavily with the uh, the recent Star Wars films. Yes. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have done. Uh, oh, how many have we done? Uh, five, five feature films and one TV series. Uh, yeah, th that was another kind of life ambition. So I always thought, oh, people used to say, "What's your ambition? Uh, do you have any ambitions?" Um, after I'd done, you know, television Saturday mornings and all that sort of stuff, and I'd always go, "Yeah, I did have an ambition. I was still on a Star Wars movie, but they've done those new ones, and uh, and so they, it feels like that's done now. You know, I've done the three prequels, and they've done the ones they did in the seventies and eighties. Uh, so, so that ambition is a, a defunct ambition, and then. Uh, lo and behold, uh, it, 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 I started to get rumblings, industry rumblings of like, hey, that JJ Abrams is going to do, they have this more Star Wars, you know, Disney bought Star Wars and they're going to do. So um, I was very excited about that. Uh, and um, yeah, doing them is a whole nother level of uh, geekology because I was a big Star Wars geek. So uh, you get invited into the, the 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 fun park, you know. It's it's a strange thing. If you told me when I was eleven that I would be doing what I'd done on those movies. Um, I just my head would just have exploded uh, because uh, I just endlessly drew uh, Star Wars characters. I had Star Wars action figures. I watched the movie to death. I watched the, the, the original movie. I have the one I actually rented. Again, it's not a visual medium, but in this room, I have the uh, VHS from my local video store of Star Wars uh, that I rented as a kid. And um, uh, I watched it, you know, 100, 110, 120 times. I, I, I adore that movie. And so when you then end up on the Millennium Falcon with Harrison Ford and Chewbacca, uh, your brain just melts. You just go, well, there's one thing which is don't screw up, don't screw up. And there's another thing which is, wow, how did I get here? It's the same same thing that happens quite a few times in my life where, where I go, wow, this is really, this is really crazy. I, I always wanted to do this. <laughs> and here I am. And that's Harrison Ford. And that's Chewbacca. And this is cool. Um, so, yeah, I am. Um, very very lucky very privileged and to be a part of that star wars family is uh mind-blowingly cool i still think that and it's very odd to say because people be like well i don't like star wars so i don't care 
go, well, that's different. It's like if you love Manchester United all your life and then you end up playing Manchester United. Or if you love, you know, I should say, in the interest of other football clubs, uh, if you love Arsenal all your life. Uh, or, or if you watch Wimbledon and you're desperate to be uh, a tennis pro and you end up playing at Wimbledon. It's the same thing. You, you, you get there and you go, wow, this is great. Don't screw up. So there's two things going on mind. One is I, I'm here. This is very exciting. And the second thing is make sure it's good. Otherwise, it's going to be a real damp script. <laughs> OK, thanks very much. Texas and Chapman. You know, that that's thankfully not happened yet. Good stuff. Good stuff. And also um, to this day, you're still involved with uh, Henson. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, we did. Um, oh, such a privilege again. I just keep talking about being very lucky, but it, there's a you know, a lot of good luck in this business, it goes a long way. Um, the Dark Crystal, um, Age of Resistance was a series we made for Netflix, Jim Henson Company made for Netflix, and um, lots of brilliant British puppeteers on side and some great voice artists. Um, making 10 hours of uh, prequel to the Dark Crystal movie. Um, and it was a huge undertaking. It took a year for me. It took three years for Louis, the director, and Lisa, the producer. Um, I guess uh, another pill self moment where, uh, and for all of us, there's a fantastic troop of puppeteers in that show. And for all of us, it was that thing of going, we are stepping into these huge shoes of Jim and Jerry and Frank and Steve and Dave and all the people who did the Muppets uh, and the Dark Crystal. Um, let's make it good. You know, let's make it good. Let's be true to what we love about that that show, that movie. And uh, so we all worked very, very hard on it. And um, and it, it almost killed us. <laughs> They're really, really complex puppet characters to use. Everything's very hot. Everything's very heavy. Um, you're in them for 10 hours a day. Um, but I mean, the, the roll call of uh, puppeteers on that was basically everybody, you know, in the UK who, who you know, lots of people you know, uh, and lots of puppet characters that are British puppet characters um they were all there and uh we were uh, blessed by a big team and also blessed by the audience reaction to the show and it and we won an emmy which is great i always think it's good if you can win an emmy before lunchtime then that's a good thing and we won we won an emmy um I, so yeah we must have been doing something right but um again neil sternberg who plays rianne in the show um who's the lead he said you know when he was a kid he would, he would make plasticine models of the dark crystal characters neil is one of the, the best puppet builders in the country and uh he's a brilliant puppeteer as well so he was a bit like pinch he was like this is crazy we're in the dark crystal like we're in thra we're in this crazy big extended universe um and warwick brown led pike was on the show he's um myself and him were assistant to kevin clash who was the the puppet captain so we were the assistant puppet captains and uh, warwick is is um uh dodge the dog on cbbc cbbs but he was out the cactus it was wonderful uh, also on cbbc uh and um, Neil and I used to do a puppet double act, Nelson and Scratch, for CBBS. C- uh, and Neil was on Clever Creatures back in the day with Otis. And uh, oh my goodness, the, the Milkshake Monkey, Helena Smee was on the show. She's a brilliant, brilliant puppeteer. Um, and let me just think, Ollie, Ollie Taylor, who's a great British, great, fab puppeteer. Um, let me think who else, who else, who else, who else? Oh my goodness, Damien, who's Mr. Duck, was on the show. A brilliant Irish puppeteer um, called Becky Henderson, who's also one of the characters in Derry Girls. So she does puppets and acting too, you see. I'm not such a freak after all. Um, and who have I forgotten? Oh my God, Catch Me, an amazing puppeteer, works with Justin Fletcher at the moment on um, Justin's house, but also has done pretty much everything you can do. She works on Star Wars back in the day, assisting Frank Oz, and she's also worked on the recent Star Wars movies. And um, have I forgotten anybody? I really hope I haven't, because they're going to get... Oh, Louise Gold, Louise Gold, T- kids TV royalty, and, and uh, British theatre royalty as well. She's a wonderful original Muppet performer uh, who also came back to Dark Crystal. So uh, I think that's everybody. Oh, I really hope that's everybody. Um, yeah, so uh, that was brilliant because what I was trying to do by naming or everyone in a roll call was say that you are in very capable hands. So when you go in to do these very complex scenes with animatronic characters, public characters, those guys are there. So it's going to be okay. <laughs> uh, with less, of, I mean, you 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 have to love it to do it because it eats time. So you know, I'd go to the office every six, leave the office every morning, every evening at eight or nine, and you do that for a year. So you have gotta hope the content's good because at the end of that year, you want to start. You know, you see playbacks of the shows as you're making the shows, uh, and when you start seeing constructed episodes and looking at it, going, "This is good. This is good." If you like the Dark Crystal, you'll love Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. If you haven't checked it out and you like a puppet series, get it on your Netflix. It's great fun. Good stuff. It's great to hear your memories on that. And also, um, you're still involved in Saturday morning TV. 
I am, for my sins, I am still involved in Saturday Morning TV because, um, like I said earlier, I'm a big fan. Um, if I wasn't doing it, I'd be watching it. Um, it's nice that it's back because it was very much cooking uh, centric for quite some time with Saturday Kitchen, which is wonderful as well. But I miss that live Saturday morning stuff as a viewer. And they asked if I'd come and do a public character for them. And I said, yes, that would be fun. So uh, I now am heavily assisting uh, Stanley, who is a small monster, who uh, <laughs> he's really hard to part in a sentence, but he's a monster and he doesn't understand the world particularly well. But um, he likes being on television and he likes uh, being kind of irreverent, I suppose. He, there's strands, common strands to my work here, as I described them to you, Jack. I realise that it's the same sort of thing. Um, but it, it, he is different. There's another layer. His voice is based on um, Ken Campbell, who's an old British actor, who's uh, very funny, uh, very kind of quite an important character in British theatre as well. Um, so he kind of talks like that. He's like, oh, 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 I don't really understand this. It's a lot of rubbish. Um, so he sort of talks like Ken Campbell. And his disposition is monstery. So he just doesn't, he just likes to eat things. He eats a lot of chocolate biscuits and gives grief to Joan Harps, who are the presenters of the show. Um, and he goes out and about and films in towns in England and uh, sort of takes the mickey out of stuff. And yeah, it's a it's a real pleasure. Again, it's the live TV thing of uh, you know you, you can't you can't get that anywhere else. Um, you know you caught you could be on the phone to kids and goofing around with them. And kids are great improvisation. If you throw a question at kids straight away, it's only adults who get freaked out by uh, odd questions. On the show, I fire questions to the callers a lot, and they're not brief, so they don't know what I'm going to say. But kids always go, oh, wow, well, they just answer because they're kids. So they have an, uh, an untainted, oh, no, what's he going to think if I say this? They just answer. So um, I love doing that. And it's the same with we, we try and touch uh, silly stuff as we can, you know. And it's uh, it's great fun. Really, really enjoy it. I don't like the alarm going off early, but I never liked the alarm going off early. The entire career spent doing jobs where the alarm goes off early. But, um, but it's great fun once you're up. Well, Dave, it's been great chatting with you today. Um, thank you for sharing all of your memories. And uh, long may your career continue, and I hope it continues to be a success. Thank you very much, Jake. It's been a pleasure chatting through those. It makes me feel very old doing these interviews. I feel very old, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you're only as old as you feel like this. So uh, as long as I keep to myself and sing Doctor Who-like into different puppet characters, then I'm very happy to do so and I enjoy it very, very much. Great stuff. Well, Dave, thank you. A big thanks to Dave for sharing his memories there. Well, that's it for another series. I hope you've enjoyed it and I've had great fun putting it together. A big thanks to everyone who has taken part this series and to everyone that has listened and supported me. I hope to be back in the future with more podcasts, but until then, I'll see you soon. <laughs>